Oh, awesome. All right, guys, we're live. Go ahead and find your seats so we can get started. All right, Gary, please find your seat. We're live already. We're on. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Okay. So... Here we are, the book of Jeremiah. Before we get started, we'll pray and then we'll get into it. Father, as we come before your supper table tonight, Lord, as we commune with you, Father, as we come to enjoy your word, we pray you would speak to us. And that this very moment, Lord, you would intervene in our lives, God, through your word, helping us to understand and to grow and to walk like Jesus. So as we go through this tonight, Father, let us be changed and be grafted Lord as you are so we thank you for this time in Jesus name we pray amen all right we've been going through the book of Jeremiah as you know on Sunday night we had Father's Day and then the week before we had that terrible storm with that wind that knocked out our power but here we are ready to get into the Holy Word so if you have your Bible turn to the book of Jeremiah chapter 41 we're going to be studying that. And while you're turning there, I'll go ahead and catch you up from where we left off. Where we saw our prophet, Jeremiah, Jeremiah had there been in Israel as it was completely destroyed. And as Jeremiah was destroyed, the rest of the captives went to Babylon. And the only people that were left in Babylon were the poor and the destitute. These people didn't have anything, and it's like the worst, in a sense, like people you don't want to minister to. They have nothing. It, it would be a very hard church to run. Any young pastor in his situation would be like, I'm going somewhere else. That'd be like if Jerry sent me to Ghoul, Oklahoma. You know, there's nothing there. <laughs> that would be like if God sent me out to the middle of nowhere. It would be very, very tough. And that's exactly what Jeremiah was doing in that moment. He had an option to stay with the people there left behind, these Jews that were in despair from everything being destroyed or go live a great life being taken care of in the Babylon army and we know what Jeremiah did he went and he did the right thing and he stayed with those people and destitute Jeremiah was no soft shoe he was no one to be pushed around but the most of all is he did what God wanted him to do he cared about the misfortune people rather than having this wonderful lavish life in the Babylon army Jeremiah did the right thing by by staying with them even though it was going to be very very difficult it would be difficult to minister with people in that situation and getting things going again but he honored them and honored God by doing it by continuing to preach and stay with them I have a very dear friend who's going through a very difficult time himself. He has these bouts as he has a hiatal hernia. And in that hiatal hernia, what's happening is it's causing him to have these panic attacks in the middle of the night. If he hits it or it moves, what ends up happening is he wakes up because he can't breathe. And then because of that, he gets a lack of sleep. And then he's in pain all the time. But what's so encouraging about this brother is he doesn't just sit there and tell me he's ready to throw it in. As he said tonight, he wants what God has for him through the situation. Rather than run away from it or take some kind of easy road out, he's allowing God to speak to him through it, even though it's been very challenging for him and his wife. Medically, as he's had issues with his heart, because of where it's at, it also affects his heart issues and one day he was driving uh, home from work and ended up having an issue where his heart started going crazy he almost had a stroke he had to pull over on the side of the road to where he passed out so it's been costly through doctor's visits it's been he's been having to take time off of work and going through all these things but in his heart he still says I want what God wants for me regardless of the circumstances he's not just running away from the situation jeremiah is not running away of situation of destitute to go have a lavish life he's right there in it with them ministering and that's where we see jeremiah now because we need that strength I have a book in my library by Joseph Parker and Joseph Parker was a minister from the 1800s and in this book he says that we don't just pray when we pray, we ask God to give us the strength to what we're facing so we can go through it. 
asking God to help us match what we're dealing with in our life because we need that strength today. I mean, we see what's happening and what's going on in our culture. Now we have this idea, or it was passed by the Supreme Court for abortion, that it's illegal. Praise God, life wins. But here's the sad part. All these companies, which I got from a friend in Bible college who sent me this, all these companies, Disney, Bank of America, Patagonia, Reddit, Netflix, Match, Microsoft, Dix, Sporting Goods, Disney, PayPal, they are all willing, and they said, it's all on the news, willing to pay for people to get on planes to come to California so they can kill their children. It's disgusting. And here's the one, most of all, like I talked about, Elon Musk a couple weeks ago. Remember, we got to watch out for this guy because everyone is so happy about his free speech. He's doing so well. Oh, Twitter. But he's never defined what free speech is. Who's on the list? Tesla. Elon Musk is backing abortions. What kind of free speech is to silence those who can't speak for themselves? Amen? Amen. Amen? That's not truth. That's him being a liar. And that's people eat it up. Oh, it's so great. He's bringing conservatives back. He's not. He is in a sense, but we don't know what his definition of free speech is. But if you're going to silence those who can't speak, why should we listen to him? That's a problem. We need that strength for today because we're facing so much and so much in our culture. And we see through this wonderful exa example of Jeremiah, he did the exact same. He stood with those who can't stand for themselves. He didn't go to live the king's life in Babylon. He stayed with the destitute. So now picking it up here, Jeremiah chapter 41, verse 1, he says, Now it came to pass... In the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the royal family, and all the officers of the king, came with ten men to Gadaliah, the son of Ahiakam, at Mizpah. And there they ate bread together. So now you have Ishmael and his men coming over to the king who's now been put in place by Babylon. This king has nothing to do with the throne of David. He's another Jew because the king of Babylon was tired of getting backstabbed by them. And he's like, we're just going to go a different route. So he puts in Gedaliah there. And there was a guy by the name of Johanan who told Gedaliah, don't trust Ishmael. He's not the guy to be trusted with. And he was warned several times not to trust this guy. Go ahead and go back with me in verse 40. All you probably have to do is go up to chapter 40, verse starting at verse 14. And he said to him, Do you certainly know that Baalis, the king of the Ammonites, sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to murder you? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, did not believe them? Then Johanan, the son of Kara, spoke secretly to Gedaliah in Mizpah, saying, Let me go, please, and I will kill Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no one will know it. Why should he murder you, so that all the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? But Gedaliah, the son of Hakim, said to Johanan, the son of Kara, You shall not do this thing, for you speak falsely concerning Ishmael. So here's Gedaliah saying in that verse, I don't believe you. I don't believe you, Johanan. Ishmael is a great guy. What a naive king, because we're going to see exactly what's going to happen to him because of this. Now, at the end of that verse, in verse 1, it says, And they ate bread together in Mizpah. So we know that Gadaliah is going to be killed because we talked about that last time. When you gather together in those old ancient times in the Bible, it was a time of prosperity, gathering together, having a meal. It was very intimate. When you invited someone in your home in that way, it was you having food with them, and it was very intimate, something very special. So if someone was to read that from the ancient times, they'd be like, wait, you invited this guy in your home and he killed you? <laughs> they'd be like, what's that? So that's that nuance there that we pick up on. They had a very intimate time, but he had other plans in doing so. Look at verse 2. It says, Then Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men who were with him, arose and struck Gedaliah, the son of Hakim, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and killed him, who the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. 
Ishmael also struck down all the Jews who were with him, that is, with Gedaliah at Mizpah, and the Chaldeans who were found there, the men of war. So he ends up doing what he's supposed to do. He ended up going there and killing them. See, Ishmael was very evil. He was a Jew from the throne of David. He was of the line of David. Now, scholars believe Ishmael probably did it and killed Gedaliah because he was passed up. So the, Am the king of the Ammonites was probably like, hey, here's your opportunity. Why don't you kill this guy? And because he's so naive, why not? And so he ends up killing him. But here's the thing. Either way, the warning that he received went unheeded. When he tried to warn him, Johanan, about this guy Ishmael being evil and not a good guy, he didn't care to listen. Let me tell you about an illustration of a guy who decided not to listen when he was being warned. A man who lived in Long Island was able one day he was satisfied as he lived a long life. He had ambition and all these things. He perched him for himself a very fine barometer. When the instrument arrived at his home, he as exactly, he was disappointed to find that the indicating needle appeared to be stuck pointing to the sector marked hurricane. After shaking the barometer very vigorously several times, its new owner sat down and wrote a scorching letter to the store from which he had purchased this instrument. The following morning, on the way to his office in New York, he, ha he mailed the letter. That evening, he returned to Long Island to find out only that the barometer went missing, but his house also. The barometer's needle had been right, and there was a hurricane. True story, actually. It, this was in the Daily Bread. This guy ends up buying a machine, some kind of barometer that would tell him when in a hurricane what happened. But the, to this guy, the weather was so clear, everything looked so fine, it didn't matter. And that what ended up happening is he ends up going to work, because I read this account somewhere else, and he ends up coming home to find his house completely gone completely gone true story so when God speaks to us or he's trying to tell us of a situation maybe financially or whatever it might be if God is trying to warn them don't blow him off no pun intended by the way don't ignore what God is trying to say to you this guy Gedaliah was warned several times and didn't want to heed or listen to what was said and because of that he paid with his life so when God speaks to you of a situation that you're in that you need to get out of, listen to him. Whether with our finances, whether relationship, or whatever it might regard. I had a good friend who lived in Oregon, and him and his wife ended up in a situation with someone. They were in there living in this house, taking care of this house, while this person ended up going to Israel. Now this person was in what I'd call a cold. Now, the Hebrew Roots Movement, all of it is an occult, but this particular person was in a more occultish part because this person believed that along with trying to reach Jews, you also had to do the feasts of the Old Testament to be saved also. Is that false doctrine? Yes. So I would call that a cult because only Jesus saves, not the feasts uh, that we observe in the Old Testament. Those have symbols and significance, but I don't do them to receive the forgiveness of Christ. So he ends up involved with this, but my friend doesn't know. All he knows is that this person that he got a character reference is, is that she has a house, she wants to retire, she's going to go to Israel, and when she gets back, she's going to sell it to you. Well, here's the thing. She had no intention of selling him this house. It was to use them while she was gone for them to just watch it. And on top of that, she had a yard and all these things to take care of that he ended up just doing all this yard work for her. Sad. But when he found out about this and some character references, the Lord had spoken to him, don't get involved in this situation. And so when she came back, he said, well, I don't really feel that we are going to be buying this property when she said, well, I never intended to sell it to you anyways. So she really, through some character references and things, this wasn't a very good person. But 
he obeyed the Lord when he spoke to him. Can you imagine getting involved, giving this person money, giving them all you've worked for financially to think what you're going to do is buy this house when they have no intention of selling to you in the first place? So when the Lord had spoken to him personally and said, you don't want to get involved with this, he honored and obeyed. And because of that, it, nothing happened. There was no having to return money, none of those kinds of issues. It was like, well, thanks. Have a good life. We'll see you later, as he found out. So as we see those things, as God sp speaks, we have to listen to what God tries to tell us. There was a massacre there in Mizpah. Can you imagine the shock of all the people, what they witnessed there as this guy Ishmael killing Gedaliah, who's now the king of Israel? And we'll see exactly what happens. Look at verse 4. And it happened on the second day after he had killed Gedaliah, when as yet no one knew it. So on the second day after killing Gedaliah, meaning he was still around those guys he killed two days. So here's Ishmael hanging out around these dead bodies for two days. This just tells you where this guy's at, what he's about. Continuing on, look at verse 5. That certain men came from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, 80 men with their beards shaved and their clothes torn, having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. So these men that he's talking about, we don't know much about them. All we know about them is that they came to mourn from the places that I just read. Now, they probably came to mourn what happened in Jerusalem. They came to mourn and cry over that the great city that God had built and the temple that David was a part of was all there, and it just happened to be completely destroyed because of their sin. And so from all these other cities, these men came to worship and to give thanks and probably build some kind of altar there in Mizpah after what had happened. Now, it says one interesting thing. It says that they had cut themselves also, and cutting was a pagan style. So it's kind of interesting. We don't know a lot about them, but it says that they cut themselves. That's what the pagans did to themselves. Self-mutilation was a big part of pagan practice. So all we know is they had come to build an altar and to see what had happened from all these cities. Then in verse 6, he says, Now Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went out from Mizpah to meet them, weeping as he went along. And it happened as he met them that he said to them, Come to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. Now, did you get that there? Now look at verse 7. So it was when they came into the midst of the city that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, killed them and cast them into the midst of the pit, he and the men who were with him. So what does he do? He pretends to mourn with them. So here's Ishmael showing up to where all these people are mourning, and he's mourning them too with these big crocodile tears. Oh, 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 oh how, what a tragedy. What's so funny is it reminds me of those documentaries I've seen on Hulu where you've seen these famous killers who have evaded the police for years. Then what they do is they go back to the old video footage and they sit there of seeing all the people mourning and guess who's in the video? The killer. There's the killer standing right there amongst all the people who are mourning for the person that he'd killed, evading police for 20 years, and right there in the video, there he stands, watching, crying, pretend to be a part of this charade when he had no care of what he did, just playing this part. That's exactly what Ishmael was doing. Not only that, Ishmael, when killed, those other worshipers who came. Why? Probably because they discovered Gedaliah. So as they had come to worship what happened to Israel, they also realized, wow, the king of Israel is dead. So what does Ishmael do? He kills them too. He ends up killing them, and it says he throws them into a pit. Now what he's talking about, a pit, it's probably what he's talking about is another cistern. Remember the cistern to which Jeremiah was put down into in the mud and all that nasty grime when he was speaking the truth and they wanted him away? That's exactly where Ishmael threw all these people into a cistern. That whole, dis it was a device to collect water, and he just dumped the bodies right into there after it was discovered. Now look at verse uh, 8, it says, But ten men were found among them, 
who said to Ishmael, Do not kill us, for we have treasures of wheat, barley, oil, and honey in the field. So he decided and did not kill them among their brethren. Now the pit into which Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain, because Gedaliah was the same one as Asa, the king that had made for fear of Basha, king of Israel. So you got to understand that king that he's talking about. That king was one of the most wicked kings in history. And they're saying this guy, Ishmael, is just like him, wicked of heart, destitute of any righteousness. He has nothing. He is just evil then continuing on he says the king had made for fear of Basha the king of Israel Ishmael the son of Nethaniah filled it with the slain then Ishmael carried away the captive all the rest of the people who were in Mizpah the king's daughters and all the people who remained in Mizpah whom Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. So what just happened here, Ishmael has these people killed, throws them into a cistern. Now the ones that are left behind basically are begging for their life. Hey, we have treasures. We have things for you. Please don't kill us. We'll give you whatever we want. Fine. I'll keep you alive and I'll take what you have, but now you're going to be slaves. And so now he has dedicated these people that were left. He had chained them up, probably tied them with rope, and is now taking them to the king of the Ammonites sending them over there. See, there was no peace because Ishmael did not want to honor what God had said. Ishmael could have been king, but the thing is, is that Babylon did want nothing to do with Israel anymore because they would not listen and do the right thing. There could have been peace if the kings would have just listened to what God had said in the first place, honored God. And that was the thing about Gedaliah. Gedaliah was not of the seed of David, but Gedaliah had it right. Gedaliah said, by me honoring and doing what's right, by honoring Babylon, I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm honoring God. Because what was God's final wishes for the people of Israel? Go with Babylon. Because of your sin and them so great, go and do what Babylon says. Gedaliah said, if I am to do what's right and honor God by honoring Babylon, I will honor his name. So part of what we do as believers is honoring what God says. And by doing that, we glorify who? We glorify God. We glorify the mighty king who's given us life, who has paid with his blood, paid a price that we could never pay. And because of that, he gives us life in return beyond measure or anything we can even comprehend. That's the God that we serve. And Gedaliah had it right. But Ishmael, because he was so angry, not wanting to honor God, was mad that he was passed over and killed Gedaliah. Verse 11, but when Jehonan, the son of Kira, and all the captains of the forces that were with him heard all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done. So now Johanan uh, had heard about this. They took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. And they found him by the great pool that is in Gibeon. So it was when all the people who were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Kira, and all the captain's forces, they were with him. They were glad. Then all the people whom Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizpah turned around and came back and went to Johanan, the son of Kira. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Ammonites. So all the people that were carried away, here they are at this place by this pool. So Johanan hears about it and he takes men with him to go save them. And I love it because as soon as Johanna shows up, all these chained people are just like running over to Johanan. Hey! He's here to save us. And throughout all the midst of confusion and everything that happened, what is, happens to Ishmael? He gets away. 
like that classic movie ending that you see, you know, all this confusion, all these things, and these guys slip out of the back somehow. So Ishmael there then now slips away after Johanan have saved them. Now continuing in verse eight, uh, verses 16 and 18, he says, Then Johanan the son of Kira and all the captains of the forces that, that were with him took from Mizpah all the rest of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael the son of Nethaniah after he had murdered Gedaliah the son of Hikim, the mighty men of war and the women and the children and the eunuchs whom he had brought back from Gibeon. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chim Chimham, which is near Bethlehem, as they went on their way to Egypt, because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, because of Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and had murdered Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon had made governor in the land. So as I just read there, did you read that? Did you catch that one of the options that they wanted to do was go to Egypt what does Egypt represent in the Old Testament the world it was never good for them when they wanted to interact for them it never ended well but for two reasons they didn't want to go because a guy like Ishmael they didn't want a guy like Ishmael to come into power again and just come and slaughter the people and the second reason why is because they didn't want Babylon to come back and find out what had taken place. This guy had ended up from the seed of David who already King Nebuchadnezzar was upset with and sick of the line of David, kills the king he puts in place. You think he, the king of Babylon's going to be happy about that? No, the people were worried. This, they're going to come back, find out, and probably ace us off too. So, in that, they go, why don't we go to Egypt? And it's sad because, you know, the thing is, with what we see in our culture today, it seems like that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, everything is Egypt. The lavish life, what we put our time into, what's happening, we see it's the secular, worldly society that's destroying our country, that people have made choices for, and it's wrecking their lives. They need the hope of Jesus. We need prayer in our nation. We need revival again. We need to pray for our nation. But most of all, it's not just the nation, it's the church. The Bible says that the judgment of God will begin in the house of God. We need to pray for the church, this weak church that we see today that has compromised. Famous pastors on TV speaking lavish words, trying to get the attention of other people, but only deceiving them. I just read this. This is uh, pretty fresh, actually, and it's... Uh, what it is, it's the Pew and Research U.S. Religious Landscape Study. And I just got this offline not too long ago. They have responded to about 35,000 people. Okay, now that's not very large. But when you think about this number and who they're speaking to and what they said, it just, you, you start to think what's going on out there of people's comprehension of just basic Bible knowledge. So they asked... In this study, this landscape study, out of 35,000 people that responded, so they actually reached out to much more people, but only 35,000 people got back to them. Now, what you have to understand, these people all claim to be Bible-believing Christians, believing the Word of God, believing Jesus Christ. That's what this survey had said. Do you claim to be this? And they all marked, yes, this is what we believe. This is what I would affirm to. Now, it says, when asked, do you believe Christ is the only way to a eternal life? A mere 6% said yes. That's less than one out of 10 person who responded to the survey. Now, again, all people say it. I believe the Bible. I believe in Jesus. They were affirming to that. Only 6% out of the 35,000 said yes. Next, they were asked, do you believe in the authority of the Bible and being born again? Meaning, do you believe that this word and the only way to heaven is being born again through Jesus Christ? Here we go. Only 17% of 35,000 responded yes. 
That means more than 80% of them believe that just being good enough will get you into heaven. Out of 35,000 people, only 17% said yes, being born again is the only way to be saved. 80% of the people believed, basically were saying that being only good enough is going to get you into heaven. This is why we need to pray for the church. It's not just the world, it's the church because a dead church can't reach people. It can't bring life if it doesn't have the spirit inside it and it's only a replicate copy that's false, it won't do anything. And we see a very large portion of the church today being this replicated copy of something good, but it's not the true gospel, therefore it's dead. And because it's dead, it won't be effective. The only ones who can be effective have the Spirit of God living in them and know Jesus Christ for who He is. Bible-believing, teaching churches that honor the Word of God, not just speak it, but live it. That's the churches that people need to be involved in today. And they're not there. I'm not saying we're like Elijah. No one's here, you know, as Elijah cried out, there's nobody but me. Ah! And God's like, I have six more, or I have 600 more around the corner ready to do my will. Elijah, don't get that thought process in your head. There are people out there willing. But the majority of false teaching has captivated the hearts of those in America. And that's why we see percentages like this, because people don't know the truth because they're being deceived. Pray for the church. Pray that God would work in your life, that he would allow you to speak to those around you. Because I don't just take it for face value anymore for people that say they're Christian. Because what's, what I've been shown is now on social media, all these people who said they were believers are now going, how could you stand up for life? And they claim to be believers. And now they're all over the social media. How is this happening? This is so evil. Oh, this is wrong. And you're like, wait a minute. Did you not say that you signed it up, that you believed that God wants to protect innocent life? And now you're complaining and angry because of this? It just goes to show you where our culture is at. And Jesus said exactly about this. In the last days, there will be a great apostasy a false gospel that will lure away many from the true faith. Watch out, be careful, and pray for those that would stand true on the word of God, as we saw Jeremiah do it, as he stood for truth for his ministry for 40 years, ministering to a people who didn't want to listen. Imagine being a church pastor trying to teach people, and they don't want to hear anything you have to say. Forget that, I'm out of here, you know. But for Jeremiah, he stayed because God said this would be hard and they won't listen, but he continued to pray and try to minister them anyways because he loved them. Do we love these people in our community, yes or no? Because without love, it is nothing. If we can't minister and try to love them, then what good are we gonna do? We're not gonna be able to help them because we're cold-hearted and we don't want to see it when we should see it and we need to see it. I just had a lady uh, tonight, actually. This is how you know it's summer in Tahoe when they start coming. This young lady came in and she had this just a, it, one of those stories that you're like, how could that, how is this even true? First of all, <laughs> you know, her somehow ID keys and everything to her storage unit got locked in the storage unit. I don't have money, I'm homeless, um, I have nothing in my hands, I, I need a USB because my phone's gonna die and I lost my reading glasses. Okay, well, I got her reading glasses, we don't have a charger, and with everything going on, it, it's amazing because m my job is to help her to know the Lord, amen? And what's amazing, even though we try she didn't want to hear it because I said, here's church. You're more than welcome to stay. And she just got up and left. She got up, took her bag of food and left. I was going to offer her food, but she already had food. And that's just how people are. But that doesn't stop us from trying to talk to them about Jesus. Some, I understand, are, are, are out there, you know, having some issues, but still we have the hope of life. We can try to help people by telling them the gospel. And believe me, it's here. Summer's here. You're going to see it. Don't ignore it. <laughs> let's be a light and let's pray for the church that we would stand on the truth of Jesus, united in truth, not some false truth. Because without truth, it's just hypocrisy. 
if I'm going to be loving towards someone and compromise the truth, then it's just hypocrisy. It's not real. Real evidence demands un unity in truth. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and its truth. With everything going on, Father, empower us, Lord, to be your hands and feet, Lord, not to shy away, not to look away like my friend Chris, Lord, who through this tremendous battle he's going through, Lord, he stands firm on you, Lord. I, we just pray for him and his health. We pray for his wife as she's going through so much with the kids and taking care of them while he's having so many health issues, Father. We pray you would lift them up. We pray for healing and a touch for him, Lord, and that you would just minister to that family and to those kids, Lord. May you be with them and guide them, Lord, and with us Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. Go before us this week and help us, Lord, that we would look and see and be alert to what you're doing in these last days. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week.